Hey everybody, and welcome to my second of two videos on the Mamiya Secor DTL 1000 or 1000 DTL, whatever. To, in this video, we're going to look at how to do things with this camera. The first video just kind of outlines everything on it. Now we're going to talk about actually using it. So the first thing we're going to do is mount and unmount a lens. And here's an M42 lens. An important thing to know about these lenses is do not use an SMC Takumar lens because it can jam in the mount and it will not come out. They have an extra pin on them. Uh, in the first video I said don't use any Takumar. I stand by that even though uh, many of the Takumars may well be safe to use. Uh, it, it is better just not to jam a lens in your camera. That would be bad to say the least. So you mount the lens just, it's a screw mount M42, so you mount the lens by rotating it clockwise and unmount by rotating it anti-clockwise, and then it just comes off in your hands. And the Mamiya lenses for this camera are some of the finest lenses made for M42 cameras. They are stunning, stunning optics, very, very sharp lenses with good contrast and color transmission. So you need to grab your nearest, I gotta assume that's Greek. You gotta grab your nearest whatever the heck this thing is, or equivalent coin. Then we're going to open up the battery chamber. This takes a single LR44 battery slides right in there. So you can see right there that the LR44 is loaded with the positive contact up and the way you can tell to put the battery in that way is by looking inside the battery chamber and you may not be able to see it on the video but there is a negative symbol on the terminal contact down there and so what that's telling you is to put the negative terminal to that terminal. There we go. So make sure when you put this on that it's not, it doesn't fight you too much. It should slide on smoothly, even if it's a little bit fiddly. If it puts up a resistance, if it feels like it doesn't want to turn, don't force it. You don't want to cross thread it. If you cross thread and strip out the threading, it's going to be very difficult to put a battery in it again. Okay, so here is the camera ready to receive film. And what we do is we just pop this film rewind knob up, drop in the film cassette, pull out the leader, feed the leader in feed the leader into the take up spool. Advance so now, if you were using this for real, you would close the film back like this. Let's set the camera down on its base. Now the next thing we're going to do is make sure that the film is taut. So you re rewind this until you feel tension. You don't want to hear the film cracking or press past when you're getting tension because you can risk damaging your camera and the film. Next, you're going to take pictures until the indicator in front of the dial is pointing to one. There we go. And now we're ready to start go and uh, shooting pictures. And the reason for that is because if you've used digital technologies, film is a different way of thinking. And film is a single use media, which once it's exposed to light is shot. So for instance, as soon as the film leaves this cassette, if it's exposed to light like it is right now, it's done, it's useless, completely wasted. So you need to keep the film in the dark until the shutter is opened. When the shutter is opened, it's exposed to focused light, which creates an image. So when you take a picture, you activate the shutter, and then you advance the film, just like that. It just keeps going until you reach 24 or 36 exposures, however many are on your roll. And when you've finished taking your pictures, you rewind the film by pushing the film rewind button on the bottom and then rewinding. 
and I'll let my thumb do the job of the film back to hold the cassette in place. But this way you can see what's happening. And that's the sound your film cassette makes when it's rewound. Now, in real life, you would want to rewind it all the, the film all the way back into the cassette. All right, let's take a look through the viewfinder here. And this is what you see in the viewfinder. You've got your split ring with, uh, or you've got your, your center ring with micro prism collar and uh, uh, Fresnel ring surround. And then over here on the right is the light meter. And it will tell you which is overexposed, up, underexposed, um, is below, correctly exposed is C for correct. And so anything where the meter falls beneath the C will be an underexposed image. Anything where it's above the C will be over. And then over here we have this uh, dark area is your spot metering area. So when you're in averaging mode, all of the light falling on the entire ground glass surface counts equally to your meter reading. And in averaging meter, average metering mode, you can see that there's a little triangle underneath the A right there. In spot metering, it switches over to the S, and that's a slightly smaller box. And what that's going to do is only the image portion inside that box will contribute to the image metering. Anything in the rest of the ground glass is not considered for metering data. And so that's why I think that this camera wasn't really a big success, was because the spot metering area isn't in the center of the frame. And so in order to use spot metering, let's say for instance that you wanted to use your average meter. The way that the light meter sees a scene, let's say that your DTL 1000 is metering this scene. And what it's going to assume is that this entire scene is a flat gray, the same color as the background. And so regardless of light and dark, it's going to take the average light uh, uh, amount coming through and determine that your proper exposure is 1 1 25th at f5.6. On spot metering, it's only going to take this area right about where my finger is right now and that will be 100% of the data. So looking at this dark area where the, where the spot metering would be, it would assume that that's gray and tell you that your shutter speed is actually 1 30th at f5.6, for instance. And I don't think that this camera took off because in order to use the spot metering, people had to figure out how they wanted to frame their image recompose, take their meter reading, and then recompose again to take the image. So it introduced a step when most people, when they're using spot metering, would use it to take a picture of something that's framed in the center of the image, and that's where they want the spot. So to recompose and recompose adds an added step. For a professional, no big deal. Professionals do that stuff all the time. It's just, an ad, it's just something that's expected. Uh, you want to meter for the background color instead of the shade that your subject is in, or you want to meter for the shade instead of the incredibly bright background behind them. And so that requires taking a different meter reading from a slightly different spot and then recomposing to get the best image. But for average users, that's not very attractive. And I would also kind of think Mamiya didn't have a very good marketing team. And I think that they, I've seen ads for this, and I just don't think that they really sold it as well as some of the other co companies like Nikon sold their cameras. So here's how, so that's how you recompose. To take a meter reading in general, what you're going to do is compose your image. You're going to be looking through your viewfinder, compose your image. You have your light, uh, you have your lever out, your film advance lever out. You push it in and then you will take your, your, your meter reading. Only when it's in will it give you metering data. And then when you don't need it, you can just push this button and flip it back in. That turns everything off so you don't drain battery power, or you can leave it out. 
I actually think it's a better idea to leave it in if you would like to hear something silly. Uh, the, the lever on that camera was out for six years until 10 days ago when I learned that you can push the button. I didn't even realize that was a button on top. It's so, um, so cunningly hidden there in the lever. One really nice thing about this that professionals will appreciate is that the meter needle, when you take your reading, responds in real time in full stop increments. And what that allows you to do is make zone calculations very easily and quickly. And that was a huge advantage over competitors' 35 millimeter cameras. In fact, uh, I can't think of another 35 millimeter camera that was that operated in that way. And this camera also indicates which metering mode it is in more clearly than any other camera ever made. It tells you that it's an averaging or spot. There's a triangle pointing at A or S right there in the viewfinder. Very easy to see what you're selected on. Many cameras will give you a symbol uh, telling you which metering mode it is. Well, does spot metering, is that the circle, or the circle with the parentheses, or the circle with the parentheses, with all the boxes around it, and which one is which? This is very simple, A and S. And in many ways, even though it's large and bulky, it represents the best of 60s design thought in that regard. Also, the viewfinder on this camera is larger than many competing cameras and many modern cameras, including the Nikon F3 and the Nikon F6. Now the viewfinder, as we saw when we looked through it, has that slightly darker area down here where the spot metering is. And the reason for that is because of the way the spot meter works. And you can see the mirror now. And the mirror has a dark spot on it. That's the dark spot we saw in the viewfinder. That dark spot is an area of partial silvering. The rest of the lens mirror is completely silvered. That area is partly silvered. And what happens is that the light hitting that part of the mirror passes through it and down to a light meter sensor, which thought I could see, can't. Anyway, so the light coming to hit the mirror the pa hits that darker spot, some of the light is passing through it and then the camera uses that as a calculation from a separate uh, from a separate light meter to determine the spot metering reading. This camera was advanced for its time. In some ways too advanced and in others too far behind actually. Mamiya adopted a bayonet mount too late in the game, not until 1977, well after all the other competitors had. But their DTL series had many features and nifty tricks that other manufacturers couldn't match. In many ways, Mamiya is like one of my favorite cars, the Tucker. And like the Tucker, the camera had advancements that most consumers could not make the paradigm shift to recognize the benefit of. But unlike Tucker, Mamiya focused on their widely popular medium format cameras. Tucker had no equivalent. Mamiya had a fallback, and their cameras, their medium format cameras, were known for having exemplary lenses, every bit as good as the competing Pentax and Hasselblad systems, and in some regards, better. Certainly, the cameras supporting them had a lot of features that made them more advanced than the Pentax and Hasselblad systems. And for that, we should be glad. Perhaps if Mamiya had stayed invested in the 35 millimeter market, they would not have focused on making the simply stunning medium format cameras that developed from them between the 1970s and the 2000s. And, all right, here we go with, all right, nice.